Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study, and we're going to continue looking at uh, Crozier's article. And uh, of course, the whole idea here is to see when Ellen White endorses something, does she endorse everything that's said? So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for this new day and a new opportunity to learn of you of your meekness and lowliness. And we invite your spirit to work upon our hearts and minds that our thoughts and feelings can come in alignment uh, with the character of Christ. We know, Lord, that uh, we are sinners and in need of your grace and mercy. And uh, we know, Lord, that light comes from your word. And so we ask that this light can shine in this darkness. We pray for others who are searching for truth, that you can lead them, and that we can be an influence for good. Help us to understand these things that we're studying, to get them correctly. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so good morning again. Now, we were looking at, at Crozier's article, and we actually skipped it. And I, the, the point that I wanted to point out and and it's in this section where he talks about uh, the sanctuary and that it's not the earth, right? So he's going through this, but Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Verse 11 of Hebrews 9, the priest entered the figures or patterns of the true, which true are the heavenly places themselves. So when we think about the fact that, that the Millerites initially had thought that the sanctuary was the earth, and they then recognized that the sanctuary to be cleansed is the heavenly sanctuary, this opens the door for a new understanding or a new interpretation of the cleansing of the sanctuary. So obviously we know that Seventh-day Adventists believe that the sanctuary to be cleansed is the heavenly sanctuary. Now, the place where we find that the sanctuary is going to be cleansed is in Daniel chapter 8, right? So the question is, if that sanctuary needs to be cleansed, how was it defiled? And Crozier goes through and shows that it's defiled through the daily service. So through the sacrifices that happen on a daily basis, that sanctuary is that defiled because of those sins that are confessed upon various animals. And then that blood is taken into the sanctuary. And so there's different ways in which those sins enter into the sanctuary. And we know in uh, the book of Hebrews chapter nine, that uh, it talks about how uh, if the earthly things needed to be clean, cleansed, uh, with you know animal sacrifices then the heavenly things that need to be cleansed have to be cleansed with better sacrifices than th these now i'm kind of paraphrasing it trying to get to it um but we've looked at this verse uh, a lot and where's the verse here so in hebrews 9 i guess i'll go back hebrews 9 verse 6 now when these things were thus ordained the priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing uh, the service of God. Now, um, that word always, sometimes it means continually, and so sometimes you can, you can take it out and show you the verses we're looking at. So when we're looking at 9 verse 6 here, uh, the priest went always. Now, the word uh, can mean continually, right? And so sometimes people will say, well, that's where we get the daily. They went daily into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Uh, the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all. Now, when you look at that word, hagion, it just, it is... Uh, just the holies, right, was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. 
So obviously the first tabernacle refers to the, the tabernacle in the wilderness, which was a figure for the time then present uh, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which only stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of the good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building or creation, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained e eternal redemption for us. Now, most of the new translations, where it just has the word Hagia, they're going to put most holy place, even though it doesn't say most holy place. And it's defined earlier in the chapter, Hagia to Hagion would be the most holy place, not just Hagia. Right. So you would need a, a doubling of that word, basically. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of inter eternal inheritance. And so it's going to talk about... Uh, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves, of goats, etc. Right. Um, moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, right? So this idea that the sanctuary needs to be cleansed, this is what we see um, being argued by Crozier, is that the sanctuary that needs to be cleansed is the heavenly sanctuary. That is the thing that is the pattern that is made after the pattern. So the pattern is the earthly sanctuary, or I guess the heavenly sanctuary is the pattern. That's what the earthly sanctuary is patterned after, I guess is how we should say it. So it's made of the pattern in the heavens. So the pattern in the heavens is the true sanctuary, right? That That's the argument. So it's not the earth. The earth is not the sanctuary that needs to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days. This is the whole uh, purpose of that statement. And uh, this this statement that Ellen White makes, uh, we had looked at it. I don't have it up right now. I don't know if I go back, can I find it here? It show it to me. Um, we'll look at that statement again. I'll find it again. I just have this other stuff queued up. Okay. Now, when we keep reading here, uh, we're going to find the passage that I had skipped over. So he says here, the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days is also the sanctuary of the new covenant. For the vision of the treading down and cleansing is after the crucifixion. We see that the sanctuary of the new covenant is not on earth, but in heaven. The true tabernacle, which forms a part of the new covenant sanctuary, was made and pitched by the Lord in contradiction that is contradistinction. So he says, uh, Crozier later explained this word was incorrectly printed, right? So contradistinction would be correct. To that of the first covenant, which was made and pitched by man in obedience to the command of God. Exodus 25, verse 8. Now, what does the same apostle say the Lord has pitched? A city with that which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God, right? So so we can understand this. So this this is this is really the main point of this article is that uh, we have this sanctuary in heaven, and that's the sanctuary to be cleansed. Standing as he was on the dividing line between the typical covenant and the anti-typical covenant, and having just declared the house of the former no longer valid, 
and foretold its destruction, how natural that he should point his disciples to the sanctuary of the latter, about which their affections and interests were to cluster, as he had about that of the former. The sanctuary of the new covenant is connected with New Jerusalem, like the sanctuary of the first covenant was with old Jerusalem, as that was the place where the priests of that covenant ministered. So this is in heaven, the place where the priest of the new covenant ministers. To these places and these only, the New Testament applies the name sanctuary. And it does appear that this should forever set the question at rest. But we have been so long and industriously taught to look to the earth for the sanctuary, it may be proper to inquire, by what scriptural authority have we been thus taught? I can find none. If others can, let them produce it. Let it be remembered that the definition of sanctuary is a holy and sacred place, is the earth in Palestine such a place, or is Palestine such a place? Their entire contents answer, no. Was Daniel so taught? Look at his vision. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So this is where we're going to start seeing where the new view idea has has some of its seeds. Okay. Uh, This casting down was in the days and by means of the Roman power. Therefore, the sanctuary of this text was not the earth nor Palestine, as the Millwrights had taught, because the former was cast down at the fall more than 4,000 years and the latter at the captivity more than 700 years previous to this event, to the event of this passage and neither by Roman agency. The sanctuary cast down is his against whom Rome magnified himself, which was the prince of the host, Jesus Christ. And Paul teaches that his sanctuary is in heaven. Again, in Daniel 11, verse 30 and 31, for the ships of Kittim shall come against him. Therefore shall he be grieved and returned and have indignation, uh, the staff to chastise against the holy covenant, Christianity. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them priests and bishops, that forsake the holy covenant, and arms, civil and religious, shall stand on his part, and they, Rome and those that forsake the holy covenant, shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. What was this that Rome and the apostles of Christianity should jointly pollute? This combination was formed against the holy covenant, and it was the sanctuary of that covenant they polluted which they could do as well to pollute, as to pollute the name of God. I'll give some scriptural references. This was the same as profaning or blaspheming his name. In this sense, this political religious beast polluted the sanctuary and cast it down from its place in heaven when they called Rome the holy city and installed the Pope there with the titles Lord God the Pope, Holy Father, head of the church, and there is the counterfeit temple of God. He professes to do what Jesus actually does in his sanctuary. And references 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 to 8. The sanctuary has been trodden underfoot, uh, Daniel 8, 13, the same as the Son of God has. So, so the sanctuary is trodden underfoot just like the Son of God has. So, but Daniel prayed, cause thy face to shine upon my sanctuaries, which is desolate. Um, I don't think we need to read the rest yet. Okay, so what is Crozier saying here about Daniel chapter 8? How does this compare to what we call the new view of the daily? I don't know if you followed it closely. It's, it's, it's uh, and, and you can see he's trying to, to understand if the sanctuary is in heaven, right, that there is a counterfeit sanctuary, which is cast down. So he's saying that the sanctuary in heaven is cast down on the earth by the making of this counterfeit sanctuary, this counterfeit priesthood, this counterfeit New Jerusalem, which is, of course, Rome. So what what do we think about this idea? Does this fit in with our understanding of the two 1260s? And how does this compare to the new view of the daily? So the new view of the daily teaches that the daily is Christ's heavenly ministry, right? Is that what it teaches? And that it's taken out of the way so that it can be replaced with the abomination of desolation, which is the counterfeit. 
is this what Crozier is saying? Are people able to follow what, what we've just read? Too much for my early brain right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trying to, to, to come in and focus on this whole issue. It takes a little bit. Okay, so let, let's look at Daniel chapter 8, because I want to make sure that people understand what, what's going on here. So we know that once we have this new view of the sanctuary, that it's not the earth, that it's the heavenly sanctuary, we do have to go back at and look at what was understood before. How does that affect the previous understanding that the Millerites had? And that's what Crozier's doing, right? He's trying to to explain if the earth is not the sanctuary, then if heaven is the sanctuary, then how do we explain the verses in Daniel chapter 8? Now, he's not specifically addressing the daily in, in like he's not saying here, the daily, the, ta- the word tamid in Hebrew, that that is uh, Christ's ministry, and that's what's going to be taken out of the way so that the abomination of desolation, the counterfeit of Christ can can be replaced. He's not explicitly saying that, but he's definitely implying it, right? So the idea that the daily is paganism and that that's what needs to be taken out of the way in order for Christ's ministry to be set up, if that's the case, then when we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the power that has to be taken out of the way would be Christ's daily ministry, right? That that's that's what the papacy would be doing, and so it would be Christ that would be hindering the man of sin being revealed, the son of perdition, the papacy, right? and that's the position that the Sabbath School Quarterly took in 2012 on uh, uh, the quarterly on on Thessalonians, on First and Second Thessalonians. So I think it was in November of 2012 that they're going to give a new interpretation of second Thessalonians chapter two, that the power that hinders is actually Christ's ministry. Now the question is, I do, uh, I could mention here, uh, I do distinctly remember that Sabbath school quarterly Mm -hmm. for the reason that uh, one of the elders at the church, at Calgary central um, called for a, a study on it. A general yeah. study in the in the auditorium and called everyone together and <clears throat> explained to it that explained to us <clears throat> the correct meaning of the daily being paganism, contradicting the Sabbath school quarterly and uh, it caused a little bit of stir and it also caused people to think it was it was uh, well done. Okay, yeah, and here and I'm and I I'm just going to show it to you here once my program catches up. This. I'm going to have a, a new computer. Well, it's not really a new one, but new to me. That, that will hopefully not do this, not keep hanging. Right? So it always keeps not responding. You can see there. So, so yeah, so back then, and you told me about that before, that your church did a study on it. Was it because of the Sabbath school quarterly that, that you looked at, at this particularly, what it was saying about Second Thessalonians? Yeah, that's what prompted him to hold the study. Yeah. And and so he noticed that that was a unique interpretation of Second Thessalonians chapter two. Well, he noticed that it gave the wrong interpretation. Yeah, yeah it's the first time I ever seen that interpretation of Second Thessalonians chapter two. I mean, all the Protestant commentaries and so forth, uh, they all uh, recognize that the power that has to be taken out of the way that hindered the rise of the papacy was uh paganism now and at the time my my university professor russell nelson uh, i actually discussed it with him so i had a conversation with him about uh second thessalonians chapter two he's a lutheran minister who was while he was alive died in 2014 in, in the fall actually i think november of 2014 but anyway he uh he said, yeah, that's the only interpretation that you can have of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And, and he was, of course, familiar with my paper that I wrote back in the 90s, um, dealing with Daniel chapter 8. So 
So, you know, we had a discussion about that and how my views had changed regarding the daily, right? So, and this is still hanging up. I don't know why it's doing that. Well, we can at least look at look at these verses here that, that are in front of us. Um, it won't let me scroll down or anything. So when we look at Daniel chapter 8, it says, It waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down of some, some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Now, we know that this is the papacy, and it's waxing great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them, that this is the self-exaltation and usurpation of the papacy. This is the spirit of Satan, right? So, so we can understand that there is what the, the scholars call this um, vertical connection. It's not just a horizontal connection, you know, paganism, papalism. There is, it, there's something about papalism that is vertical. That is, it is seeking to, you know, usurp Christ's throne, right? It's the man of yeah. sin. He sits in, in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. The vicar, the son of God. Yeah. To be Christ, to be Christ on earth is what he is. The papacy seeks. Yeah. So, so we can understand that idea of, of the papacy. So that, that part does exist. Now, when it says, and he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Well, once we have the he, we recognize that that's pagan Rome. So there is in this little horn, both the feminine, right, or neuter, the it, and then the masculine, the he. So he magnified himself even to or against the prince of the host, right? And from him, that is by is a mistranslation because the word uh, there, 4480, means from. So from him, the daily, and of course we know sacrifice is a supply word, doesn't belong in the text, was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, the his sanctuary... Like, what's what's I that? Like, well, I like that uh, slight nuance there, by, in, or from instead of by. That's, I hadn't noticed that before. Yeah. Now, it, it's kind of interesting because Heidi Hikes, who wrote a, a, a book on the daily... The daily source book and he, he goes through this now he he clearly shows that it's it's from but he does some sleight of hand so he's going to be honest with with the hebrew but he's not going to be honest with the interpretation because he uses it almost as an argument against the true view of the daily but he doesn't look at at how it's actually understood presently right so obviously William Miller, he's not going to, he's just going to look at the word by and he's just kind of going to accept it. And so he actually has a bit different interpretation of Daniel chapter eight, because he also doesn't recognize that this word taken away here, which is sir, is different from the ones in Daniel eleven thirty one and 12 verse 11, where it's the word room, right? So sir means to lift, lift up and exalt. So if this is from him, the daily was lifted up and exalted, right? Um, that is, it's going to be taken from away from the one who magnifies himself against the prince of the host. And that's going to be pagan Rome, right? So from him, the daily, that is, paganism, was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary that is uh, Rome's sanctuary was cast down, right? So we're going to know that. And then, and then it says a host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression. So that transgression is going to be connected to the transgression of desolation. And it, that is the papacy, cast down the truth to the ground, it practiced and prospered. And I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, that is, Palmoni, how long shall be the vision, the kazon, concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation 
and that is the daily desolation and transgression of desolation, that, that both desolations, um, right, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. So this here sanctuary is Kodesh, up here where it talks about a sanctuary that's Mikdash, right? So, so we've gone through this many, many times. But you can see how the original view of the daily as Miller understood it didn't take into account that this sanctuary is in heaven that's going to be, it's going to be cleansed, right? It's, it's going to be defiled and it's going to be cleansed. So Miller was fighting against another view. So the, the traditional view, we'll call it, but it's, it's, it's not the original Protestant view, but the, the, the view that was predominant in Miller's day was that this was a reference to Antiochus Epiphanes defiling the sanctuary, right? And so the cleansing of the sanctuary would happen at, you know, three, three years and 54 days, which nobody can show that that's the time given from when it was defiled to when it's going to be cleansed, okay? So the 2300 days become 1150 days. Now, so that's what Miller is, he's in that environment. But now if we understand that this sanctuary that needs to be cleansed is the heavenly sanctuary, it does mean that we have to look at these verses differently. And that's what Crozier is doing. And what he's suggesting isn't very different from what we call the new view of the daily. Now, he's not arguing and saying that the daily is paganism, and he's not arguing about the word daily, tamid, but, but he is implying when he's talking about the daily and the yearly, that he is in some ways implying that. He's not stating it very explicitly, but there is definitely something that he's teaching here that is a correction of what the Millerites understood, but it is also more similar to the new view than it is to the to the old view of the daily. Okay, so he's he's not specifically arguing that the daily is not paganism. He doesn't make that argument, and he doesn't even deal with the word daily. But he is saying that the way that this sanctuary is cast down, Christ's sanctuary is what he's saying, is that is in the counterfeit. Now, that that we, we, we must recognize that the papacy is a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary. So, so there is a, maybe we call it a middle ground view between the new view of the daily and the pioneer view of the daily. And that's often not considered. Usually what's considered is sort of a false dichotomy, right? There's two views, and the, the, the view of the pioneer view of the daily that Miller had, and the new view. And, and I'm not saying it's even really middle ground isn't quite the right way to look at it, because as far as the daily is concerned, we're not going to change that from being pagans. It's just yeah. how... Um, these verses are interpreted and how that relates to Christ being our minister in the heavenly sanctuary. That's what's going to change. What, what you're describing there in, in the short way, that this is the way the police interview people. They interview both sides and they find that the truth often lies in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Often, not always, but Yeah. <laughs> It, it, yeah, there's usually, because what people often do is they leave out certain details, right? Especially if, if you're a criminal, you're going to leave out the details that are going to implement, um, incriminate you or uh, uh, implicate. Implicate. Yeah, that's the word I was thinking. So, you know, you're going to say things that are true. You're going to leave out other things that are true that are going to give a different impression, right? Or if, you know, you have uh, a divorce and you have a husband and wife and they talk about something, they're going to bring out the things that that make the other person look like a bad person and, and ignore the things that make them look like a bad person themselves and, and vice versa. Right. So when we're dealing with scriptural arguments, 
often we we want to have this sort of divide, right? We're going to make the other argument, we're going to show it in its weakest form. Obviously, if you show the pioneer view of the daily that was based upon the sanctuary being the earth, and, and you have a view that the sanctuary is in heaven, then it's going to make sense to people who believe that the sanctuary is in heaven because you presented two different views. But we do understand that the abomination of desolation is a counterfeit just as the daily is a counterfeit. And when you understand that part, that there's these two counterfeits, I don't see how you could possibly make the daily to be Christ's ministry, right? That's right, you can't. Yeah, so if we take the position that that the papacy is a counterfeit, then we would also have to take the position that the daily is a counterfeit. But the daily isn't the real um, that's taken out of the way, right, which is the new view. But it's also not the old view, because in the old view, they're not even looking at the idea that these are counterfeits, right? That's, that's not part of the argument. They just have the daily is paganism, and they abominate. These are desolating powers. Nothing about them being counterfeits. And, of course, they don't have the week of Christ with the two 1260s, right, with the 2520. And they don't have the two 1260 years of paganism and papalism in the way that we have it in the week of Christ, because Miller did have the 1260, but, you know, took the 45 years and put it off. So you can see that when Ellen White talks about the true view of the daily, she's not arguing for a complete understanding of all of these verses. It's just that there is a true view of the daily that they were all united upon. They understood the daily to be paganism. So when we get to the issue that was happening at the, at the turn of the century, you know, at the beginning of the 1900s, and Ellen White says that she had no light on this, that they needed to actually spend time studying together and not using her writings to settle the issue. We can see why she is saying that because is it just a matter of accepting what the pioneers said about the daily in the past and 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 daniel chapter eight if if you took that position would you have the correct view of daniel chapter eight no yeah no she's basically saying study more there's more more light there because the original view has the sanctuary being the earth so obviously that that's not enough just to accept that the pioneers understanding of the daily was complete. Now, the new view of the daily is also not correct, right? Because the new view of the daily takes Christ's ministry. So how, how would we put this? So it is it's going to say that what is pagan, the daily actually refers to Christ's ministry. And we know that the daily doesn't refer to Christ's ministry. And Christ's ministry isn't the thing that's taken out of the way in, uh, well, here in this place, this the what's going to be lifted up and exalted is going to be paganism, right? So when Ellen White in uh, Great Controversy, the third chapter, where she's going to deal with Second Thessalonians, She's going to really be presenting the pioneer view of the daily. She's going to talk about in the 6th century, you know, papalism is going to replace paganism. So so she shows that exchange. She shows that this is correct, that the taking away of the daily, she doesn't say it that way, but she's showing that 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 view is correct, that that exchange occurs. Uh, So paganism wholly gives way to papalism. And that's what this is addressing, right, in Daniel chapter 8. Now, when we deal with in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, it's not the same word as we pointed out many times, right? He shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. Well, here the takeaway is the removal of it, right? The sir, right? That is not the same as room, which means to lift up and exalt. 
This is the removal. So the daily has to be taken out of the way so that they can give, that is what the word they shall place, natan, the abomination that make it desolate. So that is Second Thessalonians chapter 2, which is why when you read this whole section in Daniel 11 about the daily being taken away, and then about the king that shall do according to his will and shall exalt himself, right? We can see how that is the man of sin. So this is discussing the taking away of that daily, right? The placing of the abomination of desolation and, and what's going to happen um, in, in that uh, period, right? So what's going to happen in that period of time dealing with the papacy and, and the end of the period dealing with uh, paganism, right? So it's going to bring us all the way up to Millerite history. It's going to go back and show us the characteristic of the papacy. And, and this all makes perfect sense, right? So we don't have any sort of loose ends or things that are contradictory. It's all consistent. Now, so Crozier, it, it's unclear exactly how he understands this. But when we go back to what Crozier is saying, we can see it's not what Ellen White would agree with, right? Now there is this counterfeit, right? So this counterfeit temple of God. So, so this is true. There is this counterfeit part of it that is true, that the abomination of desolation is a counterfeit. So we can agree with that. Now uh, we're going to look at another document here. Uh, what is the desolation? Well, to destroy something, to, 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 Make it desolate to these desolating powers. They, they, they trample or they destroy, they persecute, right? Why is it an abomination? Um, well, a transgression, right? So it's, uh, like idolatry. So, so we have the daily, which is paganism, right? Paganism is a counterfeit of the earthly, right? So it's animal sacrifices and, it, and it's called the daily. Right, the continual. And then we have the transgression of desolation. And the transgression is referring to idolatry, just sort of like the daily is. But this is um, something that's in like the temple of God, right? So this is where you have Christianity mixed with paganism. So it's, it's, it's uh, paganism in Christian garb. So that's the language that's chosen in the scriptures to describe these two different powers. So one is a counterfeit of the earthly, the other is a counterfeit of the heavenly. Is it describing uh, what happened in three, whatever, Constantine, or just around that period of time when the paganism was well, creeping into the church? Well, yeah, there's that transition period, right? So in chapter three of the Great Controversy, Ellen White goes through and shows how what was pagan becomes Christian and that so she's describing that whole history and um, so that when she once you have the papalism established in the sixth century you now have the abomination of desolation right you have that that power for 1260 years so she's going to specifically address the 1260 dealing with papalism she doesn't address the 1260 dealing with paganism but of course, it wasn't understood at that time, right? So we understand that now because that truth was rejected. So, I mean, if Ellen White had gone through, like some people say, well, why didn't Ellen White just clearly explain all of this, right? Why, why, did, why is this now only being understood now? And, and you can see the sort of, um, on the surface, it looks very similar to what some people do, like feast keepers. Ellen White didn't have light on feast keeping or um, lunar Sabbaths. Ellen White didn't have light on lunar Sabbaths. So many other things that people will say, well, Ellen White didn't say it because she didn't have light on it. And, and so on the surface, those look like very similar to the arguments that we make for the 2520. The difference is Ellen White does say things about the 2520. But we can see that they're said in a way that's hidden. That is, she isn't explicitly going to go out and correct them, but she is going to give support for the view of the 2520. And then 
we, the other thing is, in order for those other views to be true, we actually have Ella White statements that have to be completely uh, contradicted, right? So if you're going to say, well, you know, the Sabbath is not the weekly Sabbath, it's it's based on the moon. We have so many Spirit of Prophecy quotes where she explicitly says, you know, that weekly cycle has been unbroken and so forth, right? That's right. You have to, you have to uh, edit out a lot of your writings. Right. But once once we understand our view, understanding of the 2520, it doesn't, we don't have a bunch of direct statements against what we believe, right? We're not having to reject uh, old light. We actually see that old light more clearly. So, so on the surface, like a surface study of, of the 2520, people just kind of dismiss us to be the same as many of these other false doctrines. But they just don't take the time to understand the nuances of what we are saying. For one, is they don't even understand what we're talking about. But they, they haven't really honestly looked at what Ellen White says and, and how this, this light unfolds and establishes what we already know to be true. So if they had done that, they wouldn't, they wouldn't say, I studied the 2520 and I think it's wrong. Right. Because almost anybody who has said they studied the 2520 and has rejected it, almost everyone has never studied the 2520. All they've done is they've read some articles about how the 2520 is uh, that. Well, basically, Sheba is an intensity. Right. They, they just look at one argument. They don't look at even what we, we teach. Right. So. But when we're dealing with this idea here, we can see how Ellen White, she endorses this article of, of, uh, of Crozier's. But there are things, so kind of changing topics here, but there are things in Crozier's article that are true, that need to be understood. But it doesn't mean that everything in Crozier's article has, has been sorted out correctly. Now, in that article, the Daystar article, he doesn't say anything specifically about the Tamid, right? The word daily in Hebrew. But he does in another article in the Day Dawn, right? So, so here I'm just going to read. This is from uh, Guilty by Association is a, the name of this article. Um, it's from Journal of Asia Adventist Seminary. So here's where... This ambiguous statements in the Day Star Extra. So I'm going to go through and read what he says here because it's it'll help us review. Okay, Crozier's Day Star article is very clear on the extended atonement in the heavenly sanctuary, but it fails to provide an explicit and exact definition of the Tamid. Modern readers, however, may find remarks that suggest an interpretation from the Old Testament sacrificial context. Crozier considered the sanctuary in Daniel 11, verse 30 and 31 to be Jesus' sanctuary of the covenant that was cast down from heaven and polluted by the Roman church. In fact, said Crozier, in the counterfeit temple of God, the Pope professed to do what Jesus actually does in his sanctuary. Through these statements, he deviated from the Millerite interpretation, indicating that the taking away of the Tamid could be a vertical activity, earth and heaven, rather than a horror horizontal activity earth to earth. Yet this view posed almost no problem to Sabbatarian Adventists who saw some room for papal activities in Daniel 8.13. Since the article did not mention the daily or the daily sacrifice even once, it remained ambiguous regarding the Tamid so that it constituted no offense for either view. And this does not mean that Crozier had no clear view of the Tamid or that he did not intend to refer to Christ's heavenly ministration with those remarks. I argue that the opposite is true, as will become clear below. But this view was not obvious in this particular article. Sabbatarian Adventist readers who would not have automatically read every reference to the mediation of Christ and to the cultic activities of the papacy as being connected to the Tamid, most likely did not perceive from this article that Crozier's understanding of the Tamid as referring to Christ's ministry in the heavenly, as referring to Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. 
right? So, so we can say, well, you know, Ellen White endorsed the article, and you know, maybe it wasn't clear what uh, Crozier was saying that that um, that he you're just looking at this fact that papalism is a counterfeit of Christ's ministry. But he's going to go and show that in the day dawn, um, an article written by Crozier is going to address this point. Um, Crozier ranked the true understanding of the daily sacrifice in the sanctuary and the proper adjustment of the prophetic numbers among the fundamental principles he and others had discovered. He understood the taking away of the Talmud as an act of violence against the party from whom it was taken, which did not happen at the transition from pagan to papal Rome. So the things in quotations, those are what uh, Crozier says. Um, by defining the Talmud as Roman paganism, William Miller, in Crozier's view, had departed from his own rules of interpretation. The key for the correct understanding of the Talmud was to be found in its Old Testament usage. Since in the Old Testament, the term is always used in connection with the Israelite temple, thereby being a Jewish institution, its antitype during the Christian period must be a Christian institution. A Christian institution, right, in contrast to a Jewish, right? Crozier never acknowledged that the term sacrifice had been added to the biblical text. He always used the phrase daily sacrifice. In his view, the daily sacrifice in Daniel 8 pointed to Christ's sacrifice that would be taken from Christ by the little horn when the papacy had put human merit intercessions and institutions in place of Christ, who was the antitype of all the Jewish sacrifices. Okay, so, so that, that, so that addresses that point. So we know that Crozier did have a view on the daily that it was Christ's heavenly ministry or Christ's ministry, his sacrifice on the cross that was taken out of the way. Right. So it's not really his heavenly ministry per se, but it's what he did on the cross that's going to be taken from him by the little horn. That is when the papacy places its institutions in the place of Christ. So you can see that's closer to the new view of the daily. It's not quite the new view of the daily because they don't say that Christ's sanctuary was taken down from heaven and cast down. They just say that there's a counterfeit of Christ's heavenly sanctuary and that what is taken away is Christ's sacrifice. When the put, when the, uh, the the priests, you know, do the sacrifice of the mass, right? So, so it's it's similar, but it's not the same. Is is any questions on this? Now, could we possibly? I mean, if we examine this view of the daily that Crozier has, could we argue that this this is the correct view of the daily? That Crozier gets it right. That Ellen White endorsing this endorses this view. Um, thinking. I'm trying to think of how to help me understand it <clears throat> without so much, so many words. Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps like a, a point form summary of what is being said. Is that, I'm, I'm sorry. My, my, my yeah, I understand. game right now. Yeah I, yeah. I understand. This is a difficult topic. There's a lot, a lot of balls in the air that we have to think about. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, like the point yeah, form. Well, well, One, okay. two, three, what are the points being made? Okay, well, uh, the points being made first that Crozier is arguing, is he saying that since the sanctuary can't be the earth, that we have to reinterpret this verse, these verses, right? Okay. Because in the pioneer understanding of the daily. No, 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 no the, explanation, no explanation, just okay. the point, okay. the points. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point would be that since the daily sacrifice is something that refers to the, the daily ministration, then that that has to refer to Christ's sacrifice. Okay. Go on. Right. So Christ's sacrifice represents. Nope, no explanation, just the points. <laughs> and so then the thing that has to be taken away is going to be Christ's sacrifice his sacrifice on the cross and in its place is going to be uh 
the sacrifice of the mass. That's what basically Crozier is saying. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. I, I can see how that's plausible. Yeah, yeah, it is plausible, but it, it, it is going to reject the two desolations being referred to here, right? So, so it is a departure from the pioneer view. So he's suggesting something new, and, and it's based upon his understanding that the sanctuary is in heaven. So, um, so it has some plausibility, but it doesn't answer everything. And, and, and we can't say that when Ellen White endorsed this article by Crozier, that she then accepted that idea. Yeah. So okay. the two desolating powers that he's not addressing then are taken into consideration? Is it two desolating powers or the two desolations by the two same powers? powers. Two, okay. two powers. So and what we are those two the powers? Daily, yeah. So the daily is the desolations of paganism, right? That's the scattering. That's what paganism does. It scatters the power of the mm. holy people. Mm-hmm. A time, times, and in half. Okay. Right? That's Daniel 12, verse uh, uh, 7. Mm-hmm. Right? So, so you have that aspect of one desolating power. And then you have another one that treads underfoot, that tramples. And that's, mm, and that's, that's, that's papalism, right? And that does it oh, for 1260 years of time, times, and a half as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we've understood papal, pagan, and papal. Yeah. 1260 12, year periods, both of them, each of them. And they're, and they're both counterfeits, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so what Crozier has done is he's focused upon the counterfeit of papalism. Papacy. Yeah, the mm-hmm. papacy, right? Right. So, uh, he says, um, uh, oh, it's a long sentence. All right, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, are you saying the paganism is one of them desolations and the papacy is the other desolation? Yep. Okay. I'll just go yep. and make it get clear in my head. There's two desolating powers, paganism and paganism. And, and that's where we get the two pulses. twelve. Right. Yeah. We both have 1,260-year periods. Right. Paganism so, desolated for 1260 years, and then it's followed by 1260 years of mm-hmm. desolation by the papers. Right. All right. That's, uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So let's read this paragraph again by Crozier. Okay. What was this that Rome and the apostles of Christianity should jointly pollute? Uh, this combination was formed against the Holy Covenant, and it was the sanctuary of that covenant they polluted which they could do as well as to pollute the name of God. This was the same as profaning or blaspheming his name. In this sense, this political religious beast polluted the sanctuary and it cast down its place in heaven when when they called Rome the holy city and installed the Pope there with the titles Lord God the Pope, Holy Father, Head of the Church. And there in the counterfeit temple of God, He professes to do what Jesus actually does in his sanctuary. Quote, and he has reference to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 to 8. That's the man of sin. The sanctuary has been trodden underfoot, the same as the Son of God has. So yes, Hebrews 10, 29 talks about trampling underfoot the Son of God. Down at 8, 13, trampling underfoot the, the sanctuary and the host. Right? So, so there is... There is a truth here that that he notices, but he, there's also something that he doesn't notice, right? And 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 he makes a mistake in saying, well, since the daily can refer to Christ's daily ministry, then you know to the daily sacrifice in the temple and so forth, the word daily tamid, though normally it's going to always be something else because we know we take the tamid as the daily. Not because it's not modifying anything. Like that's why they put the word sacrifice there, so they can modify something. But we're just saying that that it's actually the daily desolation and the transgression of desolation. That's what it's modifying. So that so that we have two different counterfeits, not just one, right? And that's what he doesn't notice. 
that if he had right. retained the pioneer understanding of the daily paganism as also a counterfeit, then we can see that there is this parallel to this to what the what papal paganism and papalism are. They are a counterfeit of Christ's 70th week because he ministers for three and a half year on, years on earth and then three and a half years in heaven. Counterfeit 2520. Yeah, so it is a counterfeit 2520. So this is this is something that, you know, we understand at least partly in this movement. Not everyone understands this in the movement. It wasn't really generally understood about how this relates to the daily and to these verses and so forth. But we can see how that counterfeit would work and that um, so there is a there's also a parallel in this week of Christ because Christ in that week of Christ, he's illustrating the history of the gospel from all the time up to the cross where we have animal sacrifices. And then at the cross, we no longer have animal sacrifices, right? We have Christ ministering in heaven. And so there's this other parallel. And you can see how people, if they have an incomplete view of things, are going to get some of this wrong. Now, Stephen, did you have a comment? Just I heard. No, I just joined. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so you missed a little bit, but you know, we went through. This is uh, Crozier's article, and it's pretty clear that Crozier, from his later article in the Day Dawn, uh, or maybe it's an earlier article, um, he's going to have the view that that the daily is Christ's ministry that needs to be removed by the papacy. Um, but he doesn't understand the two desolating powers as both being counterfeit. So he just has the one counterfeit here, paganism counterfeiting Christ's ministry. And the thing that's taken out of the way is not Christ's sanctuary in heaven. It's not cast down to the ground, so to speak, in the way that we have in the new, the new view, even though he does say uh, the beast polluted the sanctuary and cast it down from its place in heaven when they called Rome the holy city. So they're not looking for like a, a more literal way in which that's happening. They're just seeing that there is this counterfeit of everything, and that's how it's cast down to the ground, right? So it, it's not so explicit in the idea that the daily is Christ's ministry that's cast down to the ground. He, he's more that the daily refers to the Christ's cru crucifixion on the cross, so it's not so much his whole ministry in heaven that's taken out of the way, but his sacrifice itself that's taken out of the way. So it's a it's a minor distinction, but but it is important. So, you know, I propose that that the new view on the daily um, had some truth in it, but at the expense of other truth. That is, in order to understand that the earth is not the sanctuary. There had to be a modification of the understanding of the daily and the abomination of desolation. And that understanding, we, we start to move towards with Crozier's article because he clearly shows that the sanctuary can't be the earth. Now, if the sanctuary is not the earth then and it's the heavenly sanctuary, how do we then address those verses in Daniel chapter 8? And so he's correct in saying that the abomination of desolation is a counterfeit. But he doesn't say that about the daily. And if he had understood then the two 1260s, right? And you can see how, you know, as God is unfolding light, that they needed to sort through a lot of things that they didn't, right? That is, for whatever reason, you know, whether it's problems within the church or, or whatever, they get some things right, but other things aren't fully developed. They don't unfold in that time. It comes to our time when the seven thunders are unsealed that these things then become clear. And, and that's what we see happening with this movement as we continue to move ahead. We, we have a clearer understanding of all of these other problems. And I, and I think that, you know, Jeff has been making a mistake in that he's, he's trying to establish what was established. But there was still within this movement many things that we hadn't fully understood. 
And so he'll talk about the daily and talk about the 2520 and how these things are important. But he hasn't actually received the light that we need to receive from these things. That is, we don't understand them fully yet. And we are getting to understand them better. But we, we have to receive, we have to get this right. And, and sometimes because we're in this sort of argumentative position, we're not willing to look at something. And, and that's where I think when Ellen White endorses this article or she endorses Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel and thoughts on the Revelation, when she endorses, um, which we're going to look at as well, we're, we're going to look at um, uh, the True Midnight Cry article. She's not endorsing it in, as an, an infallible source of knowledge. She's an endorsing it as an increase of light that needs to be studied. Does that make sense? Do you have that endorsement handy yeah. somewhere? Yeah, I'm going to. I'm just getting it set up before you asked. But again, this computer keeps... Computer is spinning, yeah. I wonder what's going on there. So it's pretty good. As I remember it, it was a pretty good desktop. In 2014 when I bought it. Well, I had my 2008 until 2017, 2018. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, maybe I could have somebody look at it and figure out what's going on. But I know quite a bit about computers as far as getting them. I think it's just, uh, well, one is I have lots of things open all the time. Probably just need more. Yes. <laughs> That's what I'd say to Josh. I'd say, uh, Josh, my computer keeps locking up. You'd come and look, and I'd have three different browsers and about 200 tabs on each browser open. <laughs> Dad, just shut some of those tabs. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, so, um, yeah, because she's going to recommend it to every saint. Uh, let me see here. Oh, so just while I'm getting this set up. So when they have this controversy, at the turn of the century, as I said before, I'm just doing this sort of for Stephen and kind of review it. So Ellen White is not saying that what I said in early writings was wrong. She's just saying that when it comes to what's being discussed now, I wasn't, I wasn't given light on this issue, right? So when she says the pioneer were united on the true view of the daily, that's that doesn't she's not contradicting that she's not saying when I said I didn't have any light on this issue she didn't have light on the issue then being discussed right and also when she says she doesn't have light on that issue that also can be implying that since God didn't give me light on this issue it may not be light right because she's later going to say about the new view that it's um and, and the way that it was being done and promoted and so forth. Uh, I can't remember the words, uh, but basically it's, it's satanic in its origins, right? So the new view of the daily was satanic in its origins. Just can't remember how she said that. Under the influence of evil angels? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Now. Angels that were expelled from heaven? Yeah, angels that were expelled from heaven. That's it. OK, so so when, you know, if if L.O.I. says she doesn't have light on something, I mean, that that is actually a way of saying that it's it's probably not true. Right. Like if she said, I don't have light on lunar Sabbaths, that wouldn't be saying, oh, you know, lunar Sabbaths then could possibly be true because she just didn't have light on it. And so we need to study it to see if if there's light there. Right. He's just saying, God didn't tell me anything about this. And and doesn't mean it's true because she didn't have a light on it. It's actually more implies that it's not true. Yeah, this is all locked up. Um, just the one program's locked up. Um, let me see if I can find it here. No, there's another point, too, that, that uh, it needs to be addressed in Crozier's article as well. It has to do with the age of to come. And we looked at some of that. So... Crozier's view, the age to come movement, that's going to be the movement uh, that eventually has a new interpretation of the 2520 that's uh, going to be used by Barber and then uh, 
later by Charles Taze Russell, who starts Jehovah's Witnesses. So when people have partial truth, um, it can lead in some pretty bad directions. And, um, you know, there's, yeah, this other program is still locked up. I don't know why. You can try a alt, alt okay. tab and close some of the other programs. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. But anyway, we, we know that she, she refers to this article by Crozier in the Day Star and says, I recommend that he had the true light dealing with the 2300 days. Oh, there it goes. So I can search this now. I'll get this here. No, oh, that's not working. You know, one of the things that I kept that 2008 PC going was, was upgrading the RAM. Yeah. Adding, yeah. Adding probably, RAM. probably what I have a problem here with this computer. Just figure out the maximum capacity for your motherboard. <laughs> yeah. So, but you can see how, you know, this whole issue, because we go back to the issue of Smith, there's no reason that we would say that just because Ellen White recommends Daniel and Revelation saying that it should be sold by Cole Porters, that there's, you know, it's God's helping hand and so forth. I mean, do you think that those, the issues that we find with Smith, that somehow that that discredits Ellen White's endorsement. Does when she endorses something, does it have to be a hundred percent accurate? And obviously, or a blanket. Yeah, I mean, blank, obviously, Smith is a man, right? He has some opinions. He has some information that we can clearly show is wrong, right? Are we then to say, well, because Ellen White endorsed it? We just have to accept, accept accept these things, even things that we could show are wrong. We would have to say, well, we're wrong in showing them that they're wrong, right? The logic would go to also say that the books that she read uh, and used as references would also have to be, yeah, hundred, you know, endorsed a hundred percent. Yeah. Now, in, in a sense, there's some qualifying statements as well when it comes to Crozier's article. Right? So I found the well, well, when she says a helping hand, that don't mean that she she's uh, endorsing every error. It just means it's a helping hand. Yeah, and and that, that it should be sold by our full porters, and um, you know, it, it's it's a useful book. Um, there's nothing else that existed at the time that could compare with it. So say yeah, one of the best. I was going to say yes. Well, I was going to say yes. One of the best resources on interpreting the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation at the time. Yeah, and and better than a lot of the things we have now. So, um, and and I recommend things all the time. You know, books for people to read, where I don't agree with everything that the person says. You know, because I mean, what book? Is 100% correct. You know, mm. my stuff the is Bi- the Bible. <laughs> yeah, the Bible, you know, Spirit of Prophecy. Mm. But, you know, like I write articles and, and, you know, I look back at some of them. There's lots of things that I would change because I understand things better now. And, and I would assume that would continue as time goes on and my understanding uh, grows and things get corrected. So, um, you know, so there's no way that we would. We would take the endorsement means that it's flawless. Uh, so here's the statement. I believe the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days is the new Jerusalem temple of which Christ is a minister. The Lord showed me in vision more than one year ago that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, etc., And that it was his will that Brother Crozier should write out the view which he gave us in the Daystar Extra, February 7th, 1846. I feel fully authorized by the Lord to recommend that extra to every saint. So, and she says, true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, etc. right? Well, does that mean that she, everything that he had the true light on? Well, she's being specific there on the parts that she's endorsing. But what she's saying, etc. as well. Oh, Okay. Right. Right. That's what that 
what do they call that? An aspirand and a C? That's another yeah. way of abbreviating the word, the abbreviation, et cetera. <laughs> ETC. Mm -hmm. Well, that's new to me. Yeah. But anyway, we can see that he had light, but there are things there that we would have to say, no, that can't be correct. And so it, it it's, I don't know, it's just... Well, the et cetera would relate to the sanctuary? Well, the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, et cetera. So that is, he's going to explain that... Uh, uh, you know, the sanctuary is not the sanctuary on earth, right? He's going to go through and talk about how uh, the papacy is a counterfeit of Christ's ministry, right? And that they have to cast down the sanctuary to the earth by setting up Rome and the temple and the priesthood and everything, which, which we wouldn't take that position that that's what the casting down of that sanctuary is referring to. Or the taking away of the daily is the removal of Christ's sacrifice and placing the sacrifice in the mass in its stead. Now, there is one way in which you could sort of understand that, because when we look at the papacy, the papacy does take away the daily. That is, it does lift it up and exalt it, right? And, and the daily is the counterfeit of the earthly ministry of the sanctuary on earth. Mm -hmm. So you can see sort of a parallel in which you could say, well, since the daily sacrifices typified Christ's sacrifice, that the papacy in taking away the daily, which is a counterfeit of Christ's death on the cross, right? that animal sacrifices are a counterfeit of that, that in a sense, the papacy did take away Christ's sacrifice of which the paganism is a counterfeit of, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so, so there is in some ways in which we could express it that way that wouldn't be uh, the new view of the daily, which is wrong. So, this is, so they say the daily is Christ's heavenly ministry. Now, that's not what Crozier says, right? He doesn't say that. He says the daily is Christ's sacrifice. And since paganism is a counterfeit of those things, right, because the types that pointed to Christ's sacrifice, you, you could, in a sense, argue that, that, that that's a corrected view. But, but the thing that's being missed is that we have, the week of Christ, which has these two 1260s, and that that counterfeit then uh, needs to lie up, line up with the two 1260s of tip, you know, the symbolic 1260s of the week of Christ, line up with the two 1260 years of paganism and papalism. So, so I believe that when Ellen White at the turn of the century is addressing this new view of the day and not just giving a full endorsement of what those who are trying to preserve the pioneer view of the daily, right? Saying, well, Ellen White made this statement in early writings, page 74, that says we have the correct view of the daily and we don't want to accept a new view. I don't think that that was the right position to take. Ellen White doesn't say it's the right position to take. She says, no, you, you guys need to study together. And you also need to focus on evangelism and not all this infighting um, as well, right? So she wasn't going to settle that issue because it would have to be settled in the spirit of Christ through Bible study, not in this sort of um, us against them party spirit uh, sort of debative way. And one of the other points I think she was making was that uh to that that the church was young and uh, that infighting was causing division which we needed to draw together yeah to press together again yeah. press together yeah, she, yeah. she talks about this all the time and and see this is the problem that has existed in our movement so so we saw after july 18 we saw future for america what was left of it after jeff left you know make uh a pretense of 
trying to study together and trying to figure out why we were disappointed when they had already had a belief about, you know, who was to blame for, for our disappointment, which was me. And, and they already understood that, that it was, they believed July 18 to be error. And they, but they didn't want to just say that they had to make a pretense of, of looking at it openly. But the movement not, not was, only error, I think they went as far as to say it was satanic. Well, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's pretty serious. Well, yeah. And 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 th- all kinds of problems that you know still is, exist from that. So that means this movement was being led by Satan. And yet the leaders who allowed all of this satanic error to come in were now supposed to accept, well, Jeff, you know. So Jeff allowed it to come in. He made all these mistakes. And now we're just supposed to believe that he's a prophet and that we have to accept what he says. And that doesn't make any sense. Right? It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a reasonable approach. Depending and, on and, one, one man to interpret. Right. And, and, the, and, the, and the reason why I joined the movement, right, why, why I was interested in it, because of the approach that Jeff was using at the time, which was more collaborative right at least when i came into the movement all kinds of people were sharing things and and obviously you know i I, i'm nobody in the movement but you know jeff would look at the stuff that i shared he'd have me do some presentations because he was willing to look at things right and obviously if he had not done that i mean i would never have done any presentations nobody would ever have heard of me because i definitely wouldn't be pushing my ideas on the movement, right? And even with July 18, when I was told to stop, I stopped. Didn't stop studying, but I, I stopped promoting it. And then Jeff's the one who who took it up, right? So it wasn't of any insistence of mine or any pressure from me that we ended up promoting July 18, 2020, right? I mean, Jeff's going to write me and ask me questions. I'm going to tell him what I think. But, you know, nobody's hearing from me, you know, through FFA. So, so, you know, the point is that, you know, just as in the Millerite movement, light comes there, it has to be studied in the right way in order for it to be, to unfold and correctly. And so we saw that there's light, like Brother Crozier gets light. But he ends up going in a wrong direction, right? And and that wrong direction has to do with basically two things. And even here, this view of the daily that he has, or well, it's not the daily so much, but of uh, Daniel chapter eight, with with the heavenly sanctuary being what was cast down, or Christ's ministry being cast down, this counterfeit. There's light there, except that it's going to take him in a wrong direction. Right. He's going to reinterpret the prophetic periods. Right. So he's going to reinterpret the timing of those periods. Mm -hmm. Um, That's that's part of what's going to happen with Crozier. Right. That's going to influence later groups of people, as I mentioned, Barbour and then, of course, Charles Taze Russell. And and so we have these different groups that come out of the Millerite movement. So when somebody receives light and true light, as Ellen White says, it doesn't mean everything that they say is correct. And it doesn't mean that it's that some of these other things aren't going to lead in a wrong direction because she could have said, well, he received some light, but there's other things that he's received that are going to lead, lead you in the wrong direction and that are error. And you need to be very, very careful when you read this, this article. And she doesn't say that, but yet that would be true. Right. So so why doesn't she warn us about the error that's in the article? Why doesn't she with Smith say, well, Smith wrote this really good book, but there's some things in there that you shouldn't believe or and even maybe point them out you know, or something. Right. Why doesn't she do that? Why doesn't she just settle the issue on the daily? Because it would promote lazy. <clears throat> you would check it out. OK, repeat yourself, William. I said. It promotes laziness, and you wouldn't go check it out. Okay. Yeah. So are, is are there a, other 
Yeah. And there's other other instances where she basically counsels the same thing. Yeah. Like not just settling the matter, but encouraging others, encouraging everyone to study it together. Yes. And and, and also to understand things for yourself. Basic so, principle. That, so there's there's two things. One is we need to understand things for ourselves. Right? Because just because a group we could just profess to believe something that a group teaches. And that doesn't mean we understand it. But we also need to study together. So she presents both of those ideas, the idea that we individually need to understand the truth, but also that we need to study with others, and especially with those that we differ, right? Especially with those that we differ. Yes, yes. Which is the one thing that we most often avoid. We want to study with people who agree with us. We don't want to no. study with people who disagree with us. Yeah, not. I wouldn't say not only avoid, but uh, sometimes there's one side would like to, and the other side wouldn't. Yeah. So it's not possible if both parties are not willing. Yeah. And, and I would generally say, and it's not always the case, but the side that doesn't want to study is the one that's in the wrong. Because the one that does want to study, generally speaking, the reason why they have the truth is because they have been open to want to study. They've been able to advance because they're... I've, I've even found that true just in my personal experience where, you know, day-to-day -day things where I dig my heels in and given enough time, I come around to see that, okay, I'm... I might not be all right, yeah, but I can apply it definitely to my own experience. Me too. Yeah, I know the times that I've been the most stubborn about something is when I was wrong. Yeah, and we can't even see it really until later sometimes. But yeah. mm -hmm. would it be an emotional attachment to a, an idea well, or? I, I think or, part of it is that you kind of know that you're you you do not have confidence in what you believe. Yeah, well, especially my early experience. Yeah, the confidence factor for sure, but just even just not seeing it, just it's the only mm -hmm. thing I've known. I've always done it yeah. this way. Yeah, it's worked worked for me, so it should work for you. Yeah, forgetting to allow for gracious differences. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. We'll come back and we'll look uh, tomorrow. We're going to look at uh, Samuel Snow's uh, True Midnight Cry and what Ellen White says about that. Uh, but before we begin, or before we begin, we're obviously before tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for all your goodness and love and for the time that we've had here to study and to discuss these things and to try to understand the issues. We know, Lord, that the purposes of studying is to know you and, um, and to understand how you, uh, your character is connected to understanding truth. And so we just ask that you can help us in our day-to-day -day walk as we, we continue uh, to open our heart and our mind uh, to your truths and that they can do the work that you want them to do in our lives. Bless each person, watch over them and care for them and bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.